Sullivan with Premier Body Armor, and today we're joined by Carl De La Guerra. Carl, thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate having you here. Pleasure to be here, Sullivan. Thank you for the invite. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, if you're not familiar with Carl, Carl actually serves as the chairman of the International Bodyguard and Security Services Association, but he's also the founder of KDI Protective Services here in Charlotte. Um, so with his much expertise in executive protection, private security, event management, and church security, all kinds of training all over um, in this area of private security, we're super excited to just tap into your level of expertise and, of course, discuss the way that Premier Body Armor is integrated in that process. Um, so with that, I wanted to kick off with just a simple question, Carl, if you could share a little bit more to what services that KDI offers. Uh, sure. So, uh, Sullivan, this is my 45th year in the protective services industry, a combination of military law enforcement, civilian law enforcement, U.S. government security contracting, and international corporate security management. I actually moved here to the Carolinas in 2010 from Phoenix, Arizona. That was a culture yeah. shock. Um, <laughs> no cactus, no desert, no nothing up here. It's beautiful. Yeah. I love it. Um, been here since 2010, and in 2012, uh, I opened up Carl Delaguerre Inc. Uh, and KDI Protective Services of South Carolina. Uh, during COVID, uh, we expanded to uh, be licensed in the state of Texas through the Texas Department of Public Safety, and then have a training office also in Arizona. Um, we are the only private company, to the best of my knowledge, that focuses wholly on providing dignitary protection training for law enforcement agencies. Oh, wow. um, in 2012, we began training um, city, county, uh, state agencies. Five years ago, uh, we began training governor's um, details across the United States. And then two years ago, we began training um, cabinet level protective agents uh, from the secretary's offices in Washington, D.C. So along with the training, we also do uh, executive protection uh, in the state of South Carolina and Texas. And then we manage protective details throughout the United States and internationally. Wow. Yeah, that's that's quite the portfolio that you built over time. And to go from offering that service and then expanding it to training other people to utilize those practices. I mean, that's pretty remarkable and in a nationwide type of um reach with that. So uh, congratulations. I mean, you've Thank really you. built up a strong program. Um, I'm very proud of our team. That's why we were able to do it as the people that we have on board KDI. Yeah, absolutely. It's always the people that can go with you in that process and that just really strengthen it as a team. So with that, I would love to speak with uh, in regards to the training process and just the type of unique challenges um, specifically towards the executive protection realm that KDI or these um, outlets or companies that you're training, what type of unique challenges do you face in providing protections in those environments? Well, providing um, training to the law enforcement sector is a bit different than the private sector. Um, the, the resources are a bit more abundant. The mission is a bit more focused uh, in doing that. And uh, there, there's definitely a, a nexus, a tie-in to the public and private sector. One of the reasons that we entertain uh, and have uh, students from both the private sector and the public sector that, uh, that join us. But I will tell you this, there's not a single introduction that we do um, and, and single class that we do that we're not introducing Premier Body Armor uh, as a viable need for, uh, for protection. Yeah, well, we, we greatly appreciate that. Um, and I'm sure, too, that helps to, you know, build that landscape for people to realize that not only for law enforcement and, as you said, the abundant resources they have available, but for civilians or private security alike, that they also have access to those resources and that they can then take responsibility for their own personal protection or protecting others in the process. Um, so we really appreciate, you know, KDI coming along with us in that mission of helping to empower people to safeguard their loved ones. Um, so when you're going through these trainings, specifically with whether it's the community-based or private security, without giving too much away, um, what are some lesser known strategies or tactics that you teach in avoiding risks or going through the process of risk management? Um, share a little bit more about that. 
Sure, Sullivan. We have been training in churches. We have trained in schools. We have trained, obviously, private sector and law enforcement. We've trained the military, et cetera, all around the world. And, and the biggest place to start and something that a lot of people forget about is how important the basics are. Uh, yeah. We've had the opportunity to train a variety of SWAT teams around the United States. And what I tell these, these men and women on day one is the only difference between basic and advanced tactics. Advanced tactics are simply the basics done in an extreme environment. Hmm. So along with recognizing that, it's also situational awareness. And I think situational awareness covers everything from the person that's going into the mall to shop that has their, their head tucked into their cell phone, um, all the way to law enforcement officers that are, that are out on calls. Um, situational awareness is absolutely vital for all of us. And when people uh, ask me about how can they best protect themselves at concert venues, at, at churches, in large public gatherings, it all begins, Sullivan, with situational awareness. Yeah, I think there's this intimidation factor or this aspect or perspective, whatever you want to call it, of feeling like you need to already be at this John Wick level to, to be able to protect yourself, but scaling it back to foundations and that before it even gets to a high risk environment or high risk scenario, that there's a lot of steps along the way that you can mitigate that. It's funny that you mentioned the whole John Wick thing. Uh, actually, uh, he went through um, some fundamental training. And if you watch the movies there, a yeah. lot of his maneuvers just go back to some basic fundamental training got done at a very high speed. Um, that, that's just a unique a unique model there within the uh, within the movies. But it, it really is true that training is the fundamental for everything and mm -hmm. having your equipment together. Uh, and so you're able to use it. And a lot of people think when I'm talking about equipment that I'm talking about law enforcement or SWAT teams, things like that. No, I'm talking about simply going to school or going to the mall. Is your cell phone charged? Uh, do you have some sort of personal alarm device? Um, I will tell you what we've been recommending for years are the backpack body armor offered by Premier. Um, you know, do you have one of those in your backpack? And it's a shame that we have to be thinking like that nowadays. Right. But I have never seen the level of fear as high as it is right now um, within the American public. And to be able to have the opportunity to get this word out about you have to take responsibility for your own protection. We just launched here in, in South Carolina, in the upstate area, we just launched a program called community-based protection training. Mm -hmm. Community-based protection training. As a matter of fact, Frank and Alex Stewart were actually at our launch last week uh, of this program uh, at the range of Ballantyne. And this community-based protection training is all about just taking the basic fundamentals and sharing it with people who are who need to be responsible for their own safety. You know, one of the things that we forget, Sullivan, is that law enforcement in America was designed as a response agency. We have, it's an unreasonable expectation to think the police are going to be there at the moment that something is going to happen to you. So you have got to be responsible for your safety, your family's safety, those people in your office. You've got to be responsible for their safety between the time the incident happened and the time the police arrive. And that's that unique gap that we're trying to fill. Right. And how often do you have clients that you're training that start to realize, wow, this isn't as complicated as I've made this to be in my head? A light bulb goes off with a lot of them, especially the basic things that we teach. Um, it, it doesn't take investing in, you know, high value, high dollar equipment, um, right. nor is it all about the gun. A lot of people look at my background and say, oh, well, you must be pro gun. You must be everything must be about the gun that you do. Absolutely not. Quite the contrary, because if you think about it, when we travel overseas on assignments as U.S. citizens, we cannot carry firearms. Yeah. And that's yeah. something that a lot of people don't realize. So we have to be trained in tactics and techniques outside of carrying a firearm to be able to defend ourselves and defend others. So right. that's where all, all stuff comes into play. 
Exactly. And I think to go back to what you were saying about training that we have developed such a dependency on having tools versus maybe not even getting to the point of needing those tools of de-escalating or getting out of the situation before it becomes high risk. But there is also this peace of mind that comes from knowing that you do have those tools with you, that you are able to protect yourself should something occur um, that you are not prepared for mentally or could de-escalate before it came to that. Um, So along with that, I kind of wanted to step into, you know, the process of someone choosing their personal protective equipment. Um, We kind of see the same thing on our end with body armor that people kind of complicate it before people kind of complicate it before they realize that it's actually a lot more simple, like the backpack armor inserts. When body armor is typically mentioned, people assume that it's going to be a red flag, that it's going to be a full on, you know, LARPing outfit of helmet, plate carrier and plates. And that does have its place in certain times, but uh, just how easily it can be integrated into kind of like an everyday carry system. So with that point of personal protective gear, How crucial is it for individuals or security teams to have reliable personal protective equipment like body armor in these type of high risk situations? It's an absolute must, Sullivan. I tell people that no matter how well you are trained, it doesn't matter what extreme level of training you've had. If you're not equipped for that scenario, you are at a deficit. And I will tell you three pieces of equipment that we use from Premier all the time uh, is the backpack vest. Everyone on our team has issued a backpack vest. To go, or, I'm sorry, a backpack panel. My apologies. Right. To go into the backpack. Um, we also utilize the laptop, the large laptop carriers that have two level three ballistic panels in them. Uh, that covers a very, very large area. So we carry those. And then we also have begun, since the product has come out, uh, we also utilize your T-shirt vests as well, which offers uh, a good area of protection in the front and back in a very sleek uh, T-shirt vest area. Now, you do have more specialized products. We do use your executive vest, um, which is a full body covered vest that can go underneath a business suit that you can't see. Um, but we do utilize those products. And one of the things that I want to say is that a lot of companies come to us because we're a training agency. A lot of companies come to us and say, hey, hey, try this product, try that product out and see how you like it. Um, right. We don't endorse a lot of products and very, very few products make it into our inventory. But I will tell you this, KDI Protective Services, we do use Premier Body Armor. And that Ooh. says a lot about your products. Well, I greatly appreciate that. And, you know, we're, we're honored to also come alongside of you and your team and helping you to enhance your personal security and your protection and knowing that you're wearing and using armor that is created in the USA, that we're completely over the manufacturing process. We know the quality of materials that we're using. Um, and then I'm sure for a private security team or whatever fashion that you're serving um, to know that what you're using to protect yourself is high quality and that you're not compromising um, along in that process. And so that's that's something I really love that you touched on too with the Everyday Armor t-shirt or the Bulletproof laptop case or our backpack armor. Um, again, it's not this huge red flag that you're carrying it. Not a lot of people know that you even have armor, that it's incredibly discreet. It's still going to give you protection against handgun and shotgun rounds. But um, just in the same form of someone serving in executive security, um, how discreet the process is so that you're not compromising, let's say, for your clientele um, in any type of way that they can continue on with their lives in an everyday form, but they're still having that protection with them. Um, so correct. I do appreciate your kind words and yeah, coming alongside of you in that mission. Absolutely. More, more times than not, Sullivan, we have to maintain a low visibility profile where exactly. no one knows who we are or what we are. We're just business people going about our day. So we have had to learn uh, both techniques, uh, tactics, and also learn equipment that provides that low profile uh, for us when we're moving mm-hmm. about the public. And that was one of the things that impressed us very early on about Premier products is that they do match that low visibility, low visibility profile uh, that we maintain. 
Yeah, absolutely. It makes perfect sense together. And um, and that's very much our wheelhouse is that we are not the super tactical beat your chest company um, in the sense that we are everyday civilians that want to make armor in a way that makes sense for everybody, but hold on to that low visibility um, so that people can be protected in a very, again, low visibility way. Um, so I'm sure over time in this area that you've served of security that You've seen these advancements of protective gear, whether it's body armor or um, other instruments that you use. How do you see those things as um, impacting or shaping the future for both safety and security professionals and civilians alike? Well, I'm going to date myself here, Sullivan, but when I began policing in 1979, the only body armor that we had were Vietnam era flak vests, which oh, were yeah. meant to just hold the body together if you were hit than to really provide any level of protection. Uh, but that's the best tactical teams had were those heavy, cumbersome, you know, uh, uh, Vietnam era flak jackets. Uh, right. Then they started coming up with some body armor, but the body armor was so heavy. I remember the first plates that came out, ballistic plates that came out, were ceramic plates about two inches thick, if my memory serves me right. I mean, they were gigantic. Um, did they do the job? Yes, it was the best technology they've had, but I've been able to see 45 years of transition of body armor, and it just keeps getting better and better and better. And I'm very happy to say that Premier is definitely on the forefront of that. And don't get me wrong when we just talk about low visibility. For any of our friends that are listening that are police officers, Premier does have a very, very good line of heavy vests, ballistic helmets, and a lot of other specialty items like that. As a matter of fact, we run a counter assault team in executive protection or CAT team as it's referred to by the Secret Service. Um, and our CAT team is outfitted with what you were referring to earlier, Sullivan, that heavy armor the ballistic vests with the groin panels, the ballistic helmets, the, the ballistic collar, this sort of thing. Um, so you, you do, you, you go from one end of the spectrum to the other with your products. And we're very happy about that. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah, we're, we're thrilled to provide that as well because there is a need for it. Um, I think a lot of times people, you know, from the civilian side uh, kind of anticipate that they want the full on head to toe armor set up, but especially from what you're describing um, back at the uh, flak vest or the heavier armor with the thick plates. Um, in some cases, whenever it's going to that extreme, it may not be practical for everyday life. And so that's why you do get more into uh, utilizing soft armor or our rifle rated backpack inserts that's still discreet, but you're not carrying uh, an insane amount of weight from head to toe. Um, and then, of course, probably just operating awkwardly. But in the world of executive security, um, we're happy to provide armor as well that's not going to compromise uh, your day-to-day -day profession. And it's not going to compromise your mobility or um, we're just giving yourself away. Um, and so I do appreciate yeah, your kind words with that. Uh, but it, it's very empowering to work for a company that we do seek to meet that need and help enhance and empower you guys that are out there protecting people to do your job to the most optimal way that you can. And we thank you for that. And, and you know, one of the things, Sullivan, people ask me, well, what kind of body armor should I get? Mm -hmm. um, you don't want to have to, uh, your, your lifestyle shouldn't be dictated by the type of body armor that, that, that is, you're told you need to have. Um, right. That body armor should be dictated by your lifestyle. Right. Um, so whatever your lifestyle happens to be, if you are a uh, shorts wearing, you know, Hawaiian shirt wearing person that hangs out on the beach, guess what? A, a, um, a, a Vertec um, sling bag, uh, mm -hmm. which I know are, are your partners there. Um, if, uh, think of Vertec sling bag, put a, a premier ballistic panel into it and hit the beach. It's right. perfect. If you're somebody that wears a suit and tie to work every day and you feel like you need that level of protection because there's been an enhanced threat against you, get a, a t-shirt vest. There is something there for everyone. If you have a concern about your kids going to school and the safety and security there, teach them the proper way to utilize a backpack insert in their backpack to be able to protect themselves if they have to run away from a threat or shield themselves from a threat. So that armor should enhance your lifestyle, 
not the other way around. Yeah. Yeah. I could not agree more. And, um, and again, I, I really appreciate how coming alongside of KDI and that you're taking these services and these skills that you've learned over time and not only sharing it with law enforcement, but also in this new startup uh, program that you've described at this community-based training of helping people uh, to take responsibility in that way and incorporate body armor. Um, But I want to jump back a little bit for a second of the executive protection realm. I know that you've mentioned uh, the bulletproof laptop case, the everyday armor t-shirt and the executive vest. Um, how long have you guys been running the executive vests? Since they came out. Okay. Yeah. So um, at least a few years now, you mm-hmm. know, that, that, uh, that I can remember, um, you know, one of the things premier is a local company. Um, you're, you're in Gastonia. So you're right down the road uh, from where I am. So I've had the opportunity to be able to go down uh, to your warehouse. And you mentioned before American made, that's very important to us. We like doing business with local companies and we like using products that are American made. So that perfectly, but I've been able to go down to your, to your warehouse, your corporate office and all, and, and look through some of the products that are down there. Um, the executive vest is something that really caught my attention because of the low profile of that. Um, you know, there's a lot of people out there that don't need executive protection, bodyguards, if you will, every day. But when a threat arises, um, we get the phone call and we're expected to be able to show up, not just with the knowledge and expertise, but also the equipment that's needed to protect our, our, uh, our client. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then could you share a little bit about, you've mentioned also the t-shirt vest of what type of scenarios would you see your company and yourself more likely to be utilizing the executive vest versus the everyday armor t-shirt? So I'll talk about it for me personally. Um, the the everyday um, uh, t-shirt vest uh, with the front and the back panel on it. Uh, anytime that I go into a situation where I'm going to have an increased threat um, and I need to have that low visibility, something that will fit underneath a regular shirt, right. that works perfectly for me. Uh, I'll enhance that with a uh, backpack panel or a, a small sling bag panel from Premier. Uh, and that goes right along with, with the, uh, the image that I'm trying to, uh, that I'm trying to present. I don't want my, my body armor to take away from my professional image. Exactly. Uh, that's one thing. And that's really where we have to draw the line. Some people have pitched some body armor to us, other companies in the past. And my gosh, you bend over and you can see that huge hump, that crease up by your shoulder uh, <laughs> with that. Premier products don't do that. I mean, I can bend over with that T-shirt vest on and it looks absolutely seamless. Um, there's nothing on, you know, that can be seen protruding from my from my back. Um, so it, it's those tiny things like that, that, that really, really make a difference when we're trying to outfit ourselves. Um, you asked about the executive vest, where would I wear something like that? If we have a, a more severe threat, uh, against an individual and say, I'm working close protection, uh, to our client, I'll use that executive vest and put that on, which gives full side panel coverage. It gives much more coverage up in the shoulder areas, this sort of thing. Um, yet I can still maintain low visibility in a suit and tie with it. Right. So exactly. knowing how and where and when to apply the appropriate armor is absolutely vital. One piece does not fit all in the body armor world, as you know. Right, exactly. We want to make products that that fit everyday type of scenarios, but also whenever it is more of a high risk scenario that you're able to get that more coverage, as you described, of the you know higher up on the chest and then the sides as well. But again, it's not compromising to show that you're wearing a ballistic vest under a suit and tie, and it's not compromising your profession as well in the process. Um, so with that, I'd like to start to make the shift of executive protection to your uh, program that you've described of the community-based training. Um, yeah. So how did that come along um, and start up? And I know you've mentioned uh, working with a range. Are you seeing a lot of church security, school safety, um, maybe families that are looking for home defense? What does that look like? So about six months ago, how all this started, about six months ago, uh, my instructors and I were having a meeting and we were commenting that we have never gotten so many questions from the public, have never received so many questions from the public and, and concerns that the public has voiced about their own 
personal safety, the safety of their families, the safety in their homes, the safety in their offices. And we're kind of brainstormed and we're like, you know, we already train law enforcement. Um, that's our that's our area of expertise. Can we take that training that we give to law enforcement and shift it three degrees to make a product that is viable, a training product that is viable for the everyday citizen, something that a, a husband or wife can use in a home protecting their kids, something that a teacher can use in the classroom, um, just any type of a situation what type of training can we develop with that? And that was where community-based protection training was born. And right. it is really devised for everyone because, you know, while, while guns might be one side of the aisle or not politically, I have never had anyone argue with me that it's a political issue staying alive. And yeah. that's really what we're focused on. If you're not comfortable carrying a firearm, that's okay. Let us show you some options. Let us show you pepper spray. Let us show you tasers. Let us show you pepper ball. Let us show you just a variety of different things that you can use, situational awareness, uh, de-escalation, evacuating from a suspicious area. There's so much that can be done. Uh, and then for individuals that choose to pursue the route of protecting themselves with firearms, we have some great training along those lines as well. And I would like to mention our partner, uh, the Range at Ballantyne, because this is our first uh, a venture uh, to get into, a training venture to get into with the Range at Ballantyne. For those of you that haven't been there, it is, there's no other uh, range like it in this area down in South Charlotte. Um, great place, great place to visit. They've got good memberships, but that is the partner that we chose to be able to conduct this community-based protection training. Yeah, I mean, that's incredible. And especially um, helping people to realize that uh, if it's, let me back up here for a second. The point that I really love that you made that it's not political in the sense of preserving your life. There's nothing political to that. And that no. there are options out there that um, whether you want to call it neutral um, or that uh, it's, if people are, let's say, fearful of using a firearm or operating or don't know if I'm going to carry this. I don't know if I would actually use it if it came down to it. Here's some other um, tools that you can use in order to protect yourself or to not even have to get to that point in the first place. So with that training, whether it's firearms or without firearms, but specifically in the home, in the church security, in the um, school safety how do you go about the training in a way that teaches people preparedness and vigilance, but it's not instilling this unnecessary fear or anxiety of finding that balance in between the two? Sure. First off, Sullivan, we, we begin by dispelling that fear factor. I do not believe in any scared straight type program. That's yeah. not what people need. And that's not the best way to teach them. I have been a police instructor since 1981. I have taught a lot of students around the world from the private sector, from the military, from law enforcement, you name it. And what we initially try to do is to just make that student comfortable whoever it happens to be, just make them comfortable and then help them understand the dynamics of an attack. There are certain ways that an attack is going to happen. There are certain things that are going to happen during an attack. There are certain ways that your body is going to physiologically respond to an attack. You know, people talk about the deer in the headlights look. Well, that's exactly what the bad guys are hoping for. When the bad guy comes up and breaks into your home or smashes into your vehicle and you're sitting in there, they expect that you're going to have a deer in the headlights look, that you are going to freeze. Now, now what is that? That is a, a trait that goes back, you know, millennium in your DNA, that when there is something that, that frightens you to freeze and, and hold, we see that in deer in, in the wild. Because right. they hope that stopping in their tracks and not moving will help better conceal them. Well, we know that doesn't happen in the human factor today with the technology that's here. So we teach people what is happening physiologically to their body. You are going to get an adrenaline dump. 
You are going to get tunnel vision. You are going to, to get audio exclusion. There's, there's a variety of things that are going to happen to your body. And if you don't understand those and learn them, then they're going to catch you by surprise. And the right. big thing that we're trying to do to this training is, is provide self-actualization for our students. You see, when you're confronted with a situation, let's say it's a person pulling a knife on you and moving toward you with a knife, your mind doesn't care if it's in training or if it's in real world situation that this happens. What your mind understands is that it's being confronted with this situation, it recognizes it, and now through training, you're going to be able to know how to deal with it better. What I mean by that, Sullivan, is you don't wanna be confronted with a hostile situation for the very first time when it's the real deal. Yeah. Train to that level. So it doesn't matter. Any of our listeners, I will ask you this. If you are responsible for someone else's safety, please follow it with some training. Whether you're a mom or dad at home that you know you're protecting children, whether you're a husband that protects a wife, a wife protecting her family, a teacher protecting your kids, a police officer protecting their community, it doesn't matter. If you believe that you have a responsibility to protect others, please take the time and invest in some training. Yeah, absolutely. And taking the time to invest in your training, but also with that training of knowing what you have, what tools you have on set with you every day and using those as an asset and then getting in that rhythm of knowing that I'm carrying with my, I'm carrying every day, or I have this um, pepper spray, or I have this at my hand. Cause I, I would imagine too, that physiological response to the deer in the headlights, you're not processing the things that you do have immediately equipped. But then when that light bulb goes off, you don't want to get to the point. I assume that you're too focused on the tool that you're not focused on what's actually happening or getting out of there right away. Um, but then also at the same time, that balance of uh, the peace of mind that comes from knowing you do have these things in your tool belt to protect yourself should it come to that point. Sullivan, all of us like a feeling of self-confidence. Right. We like a feeling of confidence of knowing that we can protect ourselves and knowing that we can protect others, our family, this sort of thing. There's people right. that look up to us. Whether you're the boss in a company or you're the head of a household, there's people there that look up to you. And you need to have that self-confidence to know that you can protect people and that right. you can protect those that, that look up to you. Uh, right. And it's not all about the equipment, uh, like you mm -hmm. said. Uh, it's about that situational awareness. It's about just looking at what's around you and knowing when to leave. You know, people ask me, well, Carl, if somebody pulls a knife on me, what should I do? Uh, the answer is very simple. Run. Yeah. Go the other way. You know, um, that, that's, the, that's the best thing to do. Why get in a confrontation when you don't need to? You know, yeah. I, I have talked to some very, very efficient and proficient warriors from the military and from law enforcement. And the most proficient of those I have spoke with will flat out tell you, if I don't need to get in a confrontation, I'm not going to. I have mm -hmm. absolutely nothing to prove. You know, right. if there's something that I can walk away from safely and I can walk others away from safely, that is exactly what I'm going to do. There is no, when it comes to truly defending your life and the lives of others, there should not be any bravado in that picture. You should have the wherewithal, the training and the knowledge to know how to comfortably deescalate and move away from that confrontation. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. And so with that training as well, how uh, what advice would you offer to whether it's an administrator or leader in a school? As you said, people are looking up to them um, to protect the people that are in their buildings. Or if it's somebody that's been appointed a uh, leader of a church security team at their church, what type of advice would you give them? Um, in that act of protecting people around them. Um, and then also, of course, integrating personal protective equipment. But I don't want the aspect to be too heavy on tools, but also, as you said, that training and situational awareness. But yeah, what advice would you give to those types of leaders in those special scenarios? Well, Sullivan, I'm glad you asked that question because it's an important question. Mm -hmm. The first thing I would tell administrators is layer your protection, layer your security. I have gone to some schools and the only protection they have is an armed security guard at the door. Right. Or the only protection they have is a panic button under the principal's desk. 
you have to layer your security. And to do that, you have to understand, and, and I will bust this myth up right here and right now, security does not begin at your front door. Hmm. Security begins at your property line. Yeah. Wherever, whether you're a church or a school or a business, an institution, whatever you are, if you are responsible, you're not just responsible for that building, you're responsible for the property itself. So your security should begin at that property line and then layer that security all the way back to where the individuals are that you most need to protect. And in a school, that would be our children. And let me just give you an example. Um, is there perimeter fencing? Do you have access control on your perimeter? Moving forward, do you have cameras that are monitoring your perimeter? Do you have cameras that every person that drives onto your property, are they being put on camera? Is there license plate being put on camera? That is a notice to people. When you pull onto a campus or you pull into an HOA or you pull into your church and you're driving past a camera that you know looked at you and looked at your car description and looked at your license plate, um, that's a notice that right. whoever is in this facility is prepared. And the nice thing about cameras are, unlike humans, they don't blink. They <laughs> catch everything. They right. might catch it from just a singular perspective, but if you layer those cameras around and have an array of cameras, you know, whether it's two, four, six, whatever you need, that's important. Now, you go from your perimeter, you go to your parking lot. Um, do you, is your parking lot well lit at nighttime? Uh, do you have, uh, you go to many campuses and you see the blue call boxes. We're all familiar with those from, from universities and such. Uh, do you have those in place? When someone comes up to your entrance, is it locked? Do you have to use a, a ring, ring pad or anything like that to be able to gain access there? Uh, and then once you get into the facility, are people cognizant and are people aware uh, of who you are? Um, I can still walk through facilities to this day and nobody looks up from their desk. Nobody cares who you are, you walk through. That's a dangerous attitude to have. Uh, I love these facilities you walk into and the receptionist looks you right in the eye, greets you, you know, good afternoon, how can I help you? And looks you right in the eye. Right. Uh, that, that is a notice right there that people are cognizant and aware of their surroundings. And I'll pass on another crime prevention tip to you also, Sullivan. How many of you keep a small fire extinguisher by your desk, how many real estate agents put a small fire extinguisher um, close to the middle of the home that they're showing? What we have found is that fire extinguisher is an excellent tool for self-defense. That's by interesting. The way, it's great to put out fires also, but it's yeah. an excellent tool for self-defense. All fire extinguishers that are made here in the United States are non-toxic. So you don't need to worry about killing anybody with one. All right. With the with the chemical that's in it. But if you need to defend yourself rapidly, that spray coming out of you know, that white powder coming out of that fire extinguisher blocks people's vision, clogs their breathing, etc. at least long enough for you to get away and make sure that that fire extinguisher is small enough that if you do need to use it as a defensive weapon to defend yourself, if the individual your attacker gets that close, then you can use it accordingly. But think about this, Sullivan, in any office you've ever worked in, would anybody question if you had a small fire extinguisher tucked under your desk? No. No. If a realtor is showing a house, would anybody question it if they see a fire extinguisher sitting there on the floor? Absolutely. No, they would just assume it's up to code or that they're following inspection, you know, any type of litigation exactly. or like that. And, and we have found that that is a wonderful tool for self-defense. That's incredibly fascinating. Um, I, yeah, I would have never considered that, but just how uh, subliminal it is that you know it's there, but then at the same time, um, to anybody walking by, you wouldn't think anything of it. Um, and also, one thing too that to expand beyond just the building of protecting the entire property with uh, that perimeter uh, safety that you're setting up and then also in the parking lot. Um, I don't know if you remember this, but when we met at SHOT Show a few years ago, it was actually when we were launching our home shield. And I remember you and I were standing off and having a conversation and just met 
And there was a gentleman that came up that was wanting to discuss church security. And I remember you grabbing the home shield for me and telling him, you know, it doesn't start in the building when somebody enters your building. It actually can start in the parking lot. And having this home shield, too, whether you're, you know, camping out in a car or it doesn't have to be walking around with parking lot because I'm sure that's a that's a strong deterrent. But uh, I remember you gave this specific example of stopping the threat ahead of time in the parking lot and having the shield in your car and that you're able, how you're able to operate it in that way. Um, and I say that just to, you know, come back to your point of these interesting facts of how far ahead you can get above a threat and mitigate it, um, even if it's just at setting up a gate or an entrance or, um, yeah, meeting that threat in a parking lot. Um and That's so, when, yeah, exactly. Ahead of that threat. Yeah, exactly. And with these, you know, we're also seeing the very high demand in church security teams. Um, a lot of different places of worship are looking at the Everyday Armor t shirt for their church security team, or pastors are wearing executive vests. Um, what type of personal equipment do you typically recommend to people that are in that realm? You know, ballistic protection is one yeah. at whatever level they feel comfortable for their lifestyle and their and their duties. So ballistic armor is one. Okay, soft ballistic armor. Another thing that I recommend everybody carry on them is a flashlight. Hmm. Yeah. Just a simple flashlight. And you can get flashlights that are over a thousand lumens now, very small flashlights that have a strobe feature on them. Yeah. That strobe feature in and of itself can buy you a few seconds to get out of a situation if somebody approaches you that not, you're not sure about and you feel like you have to exit that situation very rapidly, that tiny little thousand lumen, 1200 lumen strobe flashlight in their eyes can give you that extra second that you need to be able to react. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, th there's been a lot of really strong, interesting takeaways, whether it's between the flashlight or the fire extinguisher that again, don't complicate the process. Keep it simple. Yeah. And one other thing that I'd like to point out also, if you are in a position where you have to, to defend people, again, in a church, in a school, at home, whatever, please get some medical training to go mm -hmm. along with Great. that. Tactical emergency casualty care. It's the hottest thing that's out there right now, endorsed by the federal government, utilized by all agencies across the board in public safety, being introduced into the private sector now all across the United States. But at least at a minimum, first aid, CPR, AED, stop the bleed. Everybody should have that. A two-year certification, everybody should have that. And that's part, uh, Sullivan, of what we offer in our community-based protection training. But in addition to that, and especially if you're in an environment where firearms are being introduced, whether you're carrying one for your own safety or you're carrying one to protect others, legally protect others, you need to be trained in how to use tourniquets and how to use chest seals. Those mm -hmm. two things there. And another thing that I wanna point out here is a little bit different paradigm change on body armor. Body armor is that you do not wear body armor to keep you out of a gunfight. You wear body armor when you have to defend people to keep you in the gunfight longer. Hmm. And that's yeah. an interesting thought about body armor. I wear my body armor to be able to sustain me in a gunfight. Right. That's the whole reason I wear that body armor. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would agree with that. And I would also add to it that it's also for the unexpected, if it were to arise of, God forbid, some type of active shooter situation that you're not, maybe you're not anticipating that you would be caught in a gunfight, but in that way you are anticipating because you've added that level of protection to yourself that if you're caught by surprise and you are a deer in a headlight and you know your physiological response is taking over and you're frozen, at least you have some sort of form of protection that's already on your body that may not require some type of um, response to it as well. Um, but that's a very strong point too, of having that medical gear on hand, being trained in those areas of stop the bleed, knowing how to use a tourniquet. Um, we've actually released in the past year or two, a bleed control kit. Yes. I've seen that. Very, yeah. It, the tourniquet to that with, uh, in combination with stat medical is very interesting because it is 
I believe one of the most straightforward processes to applying a tourniquet so that the everyday civilian, they need to go through that training, of course, um, but somebody can kind of pick it up and be able to pull and ratchet it. Um, it's kind of straightforward in its application. So we want to meet that need of training people of the general public that everybody should have access and be able to respond in that type of way. That's correct. Well, you have to look at the origins of Tactical Emergency Casualty Care, TECC. It was born out of the Boston bombing. Uh, when really? people realized that the only people that were around at ground zero, at what we call the moment of bang, there were not doctors there. There were not nurses there. There were not paramedics there initially at the moment of bang. Who was there? Civilians and police officers. That was it. It wasn't until a few minutes later that we saw the doctors and nurses rushing out of the local hospitals to be able to render aid, paramedics showing up and things like this. The, the responsibility of care, initial care, lands on you and me, the right. everyday civilian, to be able to render aid. Tell me where you have ever heard an active shooter situation occur that people were expecting. it. Right. Exactly. Ever. Yeah. Ever. No. So for people to say, well, I'm going to leave my body armor in the car, or I'm going to leave all my gear in the car, and if yes. I need it, I'm going to go out there and get it, is an absolute fallacy. It mm -hmm. doesn't work like that. You right. know, you have yeah. to have whatever, whatever, and I, I tell our students, whatever you have with you right now is what you are going to have to defend yourself. Right. Yeah. Is it a pepper spray? Is it a flashlight? Is it knowledge? What is it that you have to defend yourself? Exactly. Now, uh, yeah. Make sure that whatever you have on you at this moment is what you're ready to utilize when when a bad situation happens, because you will not have time to go back to your office or go to your car to get all the stuff that you think you might need. Right. And if you do, if you are able, you're not sticking around and going back into it more than likely you're leaving, you're fleeing the situation. And one of the biggest pain points I hear about body armor is when people say, well, I don't really go into sketchy situations that I would need that, or I'm not really in rough areas that I would need armor. But as you said, like with those active shooter situations or, um, you know, these terrible casualties that happen that it's not, <laughs> nobody's expecting it. Nobody, it's a complete surprise situation. That thought is just, um, yeah, it's, it's a very interesting one to have to address more often than you would think. Yeah, and I'd like to dispel that rumor because I've heard the same thing, Sullivan, where people yeah. say, oh, well, hey, I don't hang out in sketch areas. Okay, well, let's look at the most recent active shooter situations. Is a university a sketchy area on campus? Is a church a right. sketchy area? Is a restaurant a mm -hmm. sketchy area? No. Right. These active shooter situations are not happening in the worst side of town in the worst possible conditions. I mean, these are happening in places that we frequent every single day. Right. That's where these are happening. Who would have thought the horror would occur in Las Vegas going to a country music concert? Right. Yeah. You know, so you don't know. Bottom line is this. Protecting yourself is going to be a personal choice. Mm -hmm. and if something bad happens and you are not able to defend yourself, what is going to be heavier, the weight of carrying that ballistic backpack right. or the weight of regret? Exactly. You have to ask yourself that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. And again, it's all about confidence. It's all about knowing what you have, whether it's knowledge, the tool of knowledge, the tool of armor or whatever means, whatever you have on your body in that moment, having the confidence that you're able to protect yourself, protect the people that are looking up to you and your loved ones. Um, and even helping those around you uh, in that moment. So uh, with that, Carl, we really appreciate the work that you're doing. Um, and again, I cannot stress this enough, coming alongside of you and enhancing your team to be able to continue pushing forward of equipping people, protecting them, and helping to empower them uh, in their own way of protection. So uh, I thank you so much for what you're doing in executive protection, community-based training, all the realm and um, had thoroughly enjoyed our relationship of working together. Well, we appreciate all of you at Premier. Thank you. Yeah. Keep up the good work and thank you for the support you give to those of us that are professionals working in this field and to the general public. I look forward to a, a lot of years working, working with you. Thank you yes, for this sir. opportunity, Sullivan. Absolutely. Thank you for joining us today.